Welcome back to the pod. Today, I have Matt Shields. Matt is a 25-year-long entrepreneur who's accumulated an impressive $60 million in real estate assets under management. He's experienced the ups and downs of entrepreneurship firsthand, and he's on the pod today to share his knowledge with you looking to achieve financial freedom. Matt, welcome to the pod. Thank you, Raul. This is going to be fun. Looking forward to having the conversation here. There's a lot of different angles we can take this on technology, you on real estate, firsthand failure, failures and up and down. Maybe we can start with what is your most memorable part of your entrepreneurship journey? I would have to say when I hit rock bottom, I would say. So I led a life where I always had things. After I've grown up and I, I started establishing myself and all of that, I felt like I always had to have the best of everything and show off a little bit, quite honestly. <laughs> and then I hit some hard times and ended up losing pretty well everything. And I remember wanting to break myself of that that thought process where I had to project this image of success and show all of these things that I had. I lived in a 5,000 square foot house by myself, right? It was just like mm. things like that, that were just stupid. So I actually, I pretty well lost everything. And I was sleeping in the back of a cargo van at hotels oh. uh, because I couldn't afford to be able to stay in the hotel, but I knew that no one would mess with me if I was in the hotel parking lot. So I had a back of a van and I would sleep there. And then I would wake up at six o'clock in the morning and go to the gym and shower and go on about my day from there. So I remember those days. and I remember wanting to break myself of those habits and those thoughts of, I need this, I need that, I need to have this image, this persona that people look at me and just because of everything that I have, it's showing success. So so that's what I often go back to, that learning humbleness, I guess you can say, yeah. where everybody, I think everybody has a chip on their shoulder at one point. When you come back and learn how to be humble, it's incredibly enlightening, empowering, freeing, it's just a completely out, different outlook on business and life right now. That is significant in terms of the hard lesson and the way that you've learned it. And it's definitely not easy hitting rock bottom. We don't have to dive too much into that, but I'm curious to, because I know right now a lot of the online is about the look. It's about what you've done. There's those fake influencers or whatever. We're not going to talk about that, but let's say, do you mentor like young startups or founders or entrepreneurs? We, we do, yes. So we have a couple of masterminds. So I used to be an electrical contractor. And just to complete that story, I got into electrical contracting. I was 21, 22. Business was going well. And during the last financial downturn, 2008, 2009, uh, we had a number of companies that went out of business on us that owed us quite a bit of money, which then put mm -hmm. us out of business. So it's just a trickle-down effect. So we really focus in a lot on the trades. We've identified a lot of the problems, a lot of the issues that the trade people stumble across and they don't do well and they don't really realize it until it's biting and biting them in the butt. So we do reach out and mentor those types of companies. And then of course, there's quite an element of mentorship and just showing people the right way to do things throughout the digital transformation process as well. So there is quite an element of that. And what's great too is through the technology company, through the digital transformation, we've seen all kinds of different types of companies. We've had exposure to SaaS companies and again, construction type companies, physical That's cool. brick Cross and mortar industry. businesses. Yeah. So it's great because you can you can see the inner workings of all these different companies, and then you can morph all of that knowledge and that understanding into bringing all of that into under one umbrella that everybody can learn from and utilize. So I want, I want to come back to that. I want to go earlier when you mentioned that you do mentor and you, in the hard lesson that you do. How do you, because there's two ways to learn, firsthand and secondhand, like from others' experience. How do you impart that lesson that you had to learn the hard way to other founders and I know it's not as easy to give that kind of advice or that others are receptive to hearing that, but I think a huge savings for others to learn that. So how do you, if you were to give that advice or if you have, how did you give that advice to other founders, like practically speaking? So I feel like I use a tool to explain this type of a process. And that tool is basically just a seven or eight slide show, which all revolves around this conversation at the dinner table, Right. So again, this is going back to some of those common things that a lot of people are doing that they don't necessarily know. 
these things all start trickling into your life and showing up as different problems. And these problems are typically going to be had, again, around the dinner table with family. If it gets bad enough, we don't have enough money to be able to afford the mortgage this month. Mm. So again, I'm not going to dive into all of these. We don't have enough time to be able to jump into all of those. But like some of these are where if, if you're a service-based company, you are taking on projects. And because of these issues with how you're running and managing that project, you end up in the negative in that project. So then you have to take on another project to be able to pay off the projects, the bills that have incurred from the project before, which then puts that other project underwater. And that keeps snowballing. You keep doing the same thing, but you keep making all of these mistakes in the business to be able to each job, each project keeps putting you further and further you know, underwater. So it's about identifying all of those issues that you currently are doing and currently are suffering from that are costing you more money than what you actually realize. So interesting. Yeah. So that's one of the that's one of the primary things that we use to be able to explain the situation. And almost all companies are suffering from some of these issues at some point along the way. So obviously there's some that are suffering a great deal and other ones they have a bit of problem in some of these areas. And some of them might not have any problems in some areas, but other areas are big problems. So so I guess to answer your question, that's what I do to explain when mentor them is to get them to realize, yeah, we do have these issues. We are seeing that. And it hasn't gotten to that point yet where I don't know how I'm going to pay my mortgage, but I can absolutely see how if I keep doing all of these things, it can end up where I have to have that conversation with my wife, my girlfriend, whoever it is I might be living with. So it's fascinating. Sometimes we can learn more about what not to do and just do the opposite of that to know what we can do. Do you mind kind of sharing maybe the top common pitfalls that you've seen? Like the one that you just mentioned now is improper management of resources and time for service based cause you to go under, creates the snowball effect. What are some other common ones that aren't as obvious? Yeah. So cash flow is a big one. And being able to knowing if you have any type of limitations around when you need to submit invoices. So again, dealing in the construction industry, a lot of times the project owner has some type of bank draw or something like that, that they need to be able to submit for. And in order to submit for that, they need to have the invoices to be able to submit and get that draw. So if you miss that deadline, if you miss whatever that benchmark is, you might have to wait. Let's just say that you only they're only able to make one draw a month. Which again, on the real estate side of things, we're in this situation where we, some of our lenders only allow us to make one draw a month. So that means that all of the contractors need to have an invoice into us by a, a certain date so that we can submit it in for payment. If they miss that date, then that means that we can't, add them into the draw till the following month. So then that creates issues with all of your vendors and all of that, because you, as the contractor, you have to pay for all your supplies and your guys and all of that. So just knowing what your limitations are, having that really well defined. And some sometimes you might be in a situation where it's every two weeks, you have to have yeah. invoices in for it. it might not be a month, but still making sure that you have that cash flow available when you need it and making sure that you're you're applying that to the right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, the simplicity of that. Yeah, I mean, it's it, a lot of these things are very simple. And once once you understand them, it's, yeah, we are doing that. We are suffering from that. How do we fix that? How Again, for the invoicing side of things, what is the delay? Why are you taking so long to create your invoices? Is it because you know, you're trying to you know find all the receipts so that you can <laughs> invoice it? Or do you have... Do you, are you trying to do all of the invoicing yourself and you're out working all day long and then you got to come back and try to do this at seven o'clock at night and get all of, and then you're, you're trying to bring all of this information together with all of these things that you've purchased or bought so that you can create this invoice. What is it? What is your process there? Right? Hmm. So just walking through a lot of those steps. And again, through the digital transformation, we have access to a lot of different types of software as well. So sometimes it's just a matter of, Hey, you should be using Expensify for instance, so that you can, you know, you walk into Home Depot or wherever it is, you take a picture of the receipt and then you categorize it right away. And then you have that report Immediate. at the end of the, yeah, yeah exactly. So it, it doesn't have to be a custom solution or a custom solution that you integrate into your process. It can be simple, something simple that 
can be integrated as well. So trying to think of some of the other ones off the top of my head, there's trying to think, I, I always have the, I always have this presentation open. And actually, if you just give me a second here, I can open yeah. this up so that I can rattle through some more of these things. So uh, well, just... as you're pulling that up, I can just recap briefly around the importance of the administrative side of the business. It's essentially not the most appealing to most. We want to do the work. We want to do the sales, we want to do the marketing, but the actual administration of it and the fact that you mentioned you could just use off the rack software, that's the tools that are pre-built for specific functions. But thinking of your time input saying, oh, I, I don't want to pay for a $200 a month software. Well, think about how much that is per day, per hour, per your time versus the software. I always invest in tech or team or support instead of me doing these kinds of things, but also starting to make me think about what are my internal processes for the very simple things that I shouldn't be doing. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That's exactly the way that you should be looking at it. Even I've heard all kinds of different theories on this, but it all comes back down to just knowing what your worth is and knowing what you, what your hour, true hourly rate is. And it shouldn't be looking at yourself as like a $50 an hour person. You should be the owner of the company. You should be charging <laughs> yourself out at many more times than that. But if you're charging yourself what you would be charging on an expensive uh, an expensive employee, that's all you are is just basically an expensive employee. So you shouldn't be looking at yourself in that light, if that makes oh, sense. There was a GIF or an image I saw online. It was a, it's a, like a little pill bottle and it said, hard pills to swallow. And <laughs> that's yep, a tough yep. one to swallow right there. Yep. Do so we another, have a job or do we have a business, essentially, is what you're saying? Exactly, exactly. I, another one of those common problems, and by the way, we did a lot of research. We've polled about 150 different companies, and these were the top things that that they were reporting. So 73% of companies reported losing revenue because they did not, they did not document change orders correctly. So hmm. again, something in your agreement, something in your process had changed or was added to whatever that total project was. And you did not get the proper approvals and the proper signatures in place so that you were able to invoice or collect on that money when it came time to, to go ahead and collect on it. So 73% of people or companies reported that. We went through the draws. 78% of contractors admitted to making mistakes on the bidding process. So again, this is knowing your product, knowing your knowing your process and what the construction process should entail. A lot of people are making mistakes right there, according to what people are reporting here. 47% of contractors indicated that they had surprises come up for jobs where costs were not tracked accurately. So this, oh, wow. is, this is something where uh, people are saying yes, we'll go ahead and do that, go ahead and do that to these various different subs. Like, again, I'm honing in specifically on construction contractors, but this could happen in them, many different types of businesses where you know, you're know you saying, yes, we need to do that, we need to do that, we need to do that, which kind of goes back to getting the change orders. Uh, so what ends up happening is if you're not documenting all of these changes, all of these additions, you end up getting the stack of invoices from this sub that now you have to pay and you can't go back to the con or to the project the client, owner yeah. to be able to get to get these to get these reimbursed. So 47% of yeah, contractors. Yeah, it's for the expectations. And this is in construction, but I'm already thinking, so I work with digital companies. Service-based mm -hmm. is very much in parallel. Exactly. Yeah. Th these are, I'm again, I'm focusing in on construction contractors here, but these are problems that pretty well every business has at some capacity. 30% said that, or 33% said that they've been in a position where they had to hold their price. So this is actually changing a little bit. So again, this is in construction. So before, I'm going to say two years ago, everyone would provide a price and there was no, there were no parameters around any type of material fluctuations or anything like that. And obviously we've all heard of all the supply chain issues and everything oh, yeah. where- Sometimes double costs. Exactly. So you need to make sure that you have provisions in your contracts to make sure that you're able to increase that price if if material changes if if that that whatever the costs are of those products that you're including into your end result if those products change you need to make sure that you're incorporating that into flexibility that's an interesting nuance yeah yep 
67% of business owners admitted to taking funds. We talked about this, taking from one funds from one project to finish another one. And then, yeah, that's that was actually uh, the last one. So again, it's all about cash flow and being able to manage those expectations throughout the business, throughout the throughout the process so that you end up coming out the other end after the project is done with an actual profit rather than being in the negative. So, so again, according to our research, those are the top things that a lot of companies are doing uh, wrong or they have issues in their process that are contributing to those issues, which ultimately end up yielding a negative negative cash flow when it's all said and done. So, or at least not as much as what you should have made. Does that make sense? No, that makes a lot of sense. Now I want to flip this on the entrepreneur lens. Do you, is it the chicken or the egg? Did you look at these problems first and create solutions for them? Or were you looking for solutions and identify the problems first? So I will say again, I've been an entrepreneur for a long time. This was not something that I realized right off the bat. And Again, through the digital transformation, through looking at all of these different companies, I started looking at being able to see through all of the the fluff and the things on the outside, how they're doing things, and being able to see, well, that's what the that's what is the real cause of this, or that's what the real result is of this thing that is happening. So it's definitely something that has evolved and come to light after many years of myself going through this and also other companies at the same time. So. No, I hear you. I hear you. When it comes to value creation, how are you managing your portfolio across the technology, the investments and other, other endeavors that you have? Cause I think it's important to be able to see your self as part of the business, but like you mentioned earlier, you're not an employee, quote unquote, like an employee that you're an owner. How do you manage yourself and seeing value creation so that you can focus on the top priorities and add the most value to each market in respect to business? Yeah. And I think that gets back to having the right types of meetings with your team and staff. So we have this, we'll call it a meeting cadence that we go through, right? So we like to first start off with any type of successes anything that we're feeling good about. So that is injecting a little bit of positivity, you know, into, into the meeting right at the bat. So again, that could be personal. That could be, you're proud that you ran a mile last night or you took the kids for ice cream, right? It doesn't have to be this big grandiose thing that they're, that they're proud of. If they're, if they have something great or have something that big, great. Or if it's on the business side of things and they're proud of something that they accomplished, name those things. Next, we dive into any issues that might be might be happening, right? So throughout the week, we have these lists that whenever something is coming up where you are struggling with your, you might be frustrated with whatever this issue might be, there's always a challenge, you're missing information or whatever it is, it goes onto this list so that when we all meet, we can talk Address about those. whatever, yeah. yeah, whatever that issue is, and then we can help solve those types of things. Or I should also say too that this list is not completed every week either. We obviously check off what we can right there, but the point of this is that maybe next week we can go ahead and check off whatever that issue was that revealed itself during this meeting. So this is a way to be able to keep those things top of mind for everyone as they're going on throughout their day that I was assigned this task, I have to I have to complete this, or I should say I was assigned this issue, I have to complete it before next week or as soon as I possibly can. So, so it's a way to be able to, again, keep all of those things top of mind. And then thirdly, we go through the to-do list, right? So again, these are all of the things that we want to accomplish. And there's an element, I don't know if you've, or you're familiar with traction or anything, mm-hmm. but there's an element of building rocks and milestones and all of that you know, that's incorporated in this as well. But we basically do that throughout the company. So this kind of just trickles up to the meetings that I'm involved in, but everybody throughout the company all has their own level of these types of meetings that happen. And everyone does a daily huddle as well, where that's just a five, 10 minute meeting that happens first thing in the morning that I'm going to get this done today, or I'm struggling with this. They basically answer three questions. This is what I'm going to do today. Or no, I'm sorry. This is what I did yesterday. This is what I'm, I plan to do today. And then this is what I'm struggling with, or these are challenges that I'm having. With. Yeah. So, yeah. so every day, everybody's checking in to make sure that, you know, they're, you in know, the they're huddle expressing. Format, right? You do the actual huddle. 
Uh, no, I don't do the huddle. Yeah. So again, the teams, the, the individual do the teams, huddles. Yeah, yeah, do the huddles. Yeah. Okay. And then what we always say is if a conversation starts to develop, again, this should just be a real quick five to 10 minute thing. If a conversation starts happening in those huddles, that's something that should be incorporated into the once a week meeting. So put that issue or that topic into that once a week meeting so that it can be brought up at that time. And that's when those are those are tackled. So again, we've got different layers of these meetings happening every day, once a week, all of these things happen and all of that sort that stuff trickles up to me and all the other managers and all of that. So does that make sense? Yeah, no, I call it making the heartbeat of the company. And I'm glad that you outlined a very similar format that I go through with the teams because it's essential to be able to have a pulse because not only yep. does it do the teams need the pulse, they need they want to make sure that even in a remote landscape, there's a consistency in the work, yep. but also yep. that you are thoroughly informed of where can I have the most value versus just going to that meeting and saying, what questions do we have? And everyone's exactly. starry eyed. And, and it gives people an outlet too. A lot of people feel like I don't know how to express myself. I have this issue. I don't want to seem like I'm the problem. I don't want to bring this up by being very transparent and very open with this process. Nothing gets swept under the rug then. Nobody's embarrassed about bringing something up. If this, again, if there's a frustration or an issue that is popping up, let's bring it up. Maybe there's a better way to do things. Or if you have an idea of a better way to do things, bring that up and we can discuss it and then either integrate it, implement it, or maybe tweak whatever that process is to be able to smooth it out a little bit better. So no, absolutely. Switching gears here and looking towards the future and with the current projects that you're involved, the podcast, the coaching, the training, the real estate, the tech, what macro trends are you looking at that are exciting you the most? And how are you aligning your current ventures towards that? Or maybe it's what's most exciting for you in the future is another way of asking that. I would say two things. So we are, we're bringing a lot of this information, a lot of this data that we talked about earlier together to be able to help business owners streamline their business. And then we have these connections to these various real estate opportunities, even tech opportunities as well, where we want to be able to put these opportunities in front of more people. These are things that a lot of people don't necessarily see on Mm. a daily basis, right? Unless you know someone who's in this particular industry, but these are investment opportunities that can create passive income. So as you have your business, Mm. as you're growing your business, as you generate more, more capital, invest it into other opportunities, other things to be able to diversify yourself so that you do have money that's working for you rather than constantly Just spinning the there. wheel. And yeah, exactly. Co- constantly generating it. So so I would say that I'm really excited about being able to bring that to more people. And then also we mentioned before we started recording here, I'm also on the board of another startup, which The problem that we've identified is that a lot of business owners, most business owners, as a matter of fact, and I don't remember what the number is, but most business owners are in a situation where they work their entire lives to build a company. When it comes time to sell or time to get out of that business, they're in a position where they have to liquidate everything rather than have someone come in and acquire them. And that's, again, because they don't have these systems. They're not building a business where it's actually truly generating revenue. If if you're out there doing the work all the time and you're the one who's making the business come in and people are coming in to see you, you don't have a business that is going to be worth anything in the long run. You're going to end up, maybe you're lucky enough to acquire a building or some equipment or whatever. All of that stuff is going to be what's going to get liquidated and whatever is left over at the end is what you're basically going to walk away with. Mm-hmm. Whereas you can set this up so that it could be, it could be legacy driven where you work this in where you are still part owner of this. So you're constantly getting revenue from it, or you can get a larger upfront payment where, you know, someone comes in and buys you out completely. So that's what really what we're excited about moving forward with helping people actually put themselves on that path where they can have something that is actually valuable when it does come time to exit their business, exit their company, retire, move on, whatever it is that they're looking to do. So that no, makes a lot of sense. So like from the active income into passive income, but also that active income, how do you transform that into an asset versus just exactly. being active? Yep, exactly. exactly. Oh, that's fascinating. For our listeners out there, Matt, where's the best place for people to one, thank you for being on and two, learn about more of what you're up to. 
Yeah. So I would say check out Invest in Square Feet, which is our podcast. We talk about all kinds of things, all kinds of things, entrepreneurial business, real estate, streamlining your business, all kinds of different topics there. And then also I'm active on LinkedIn too. And that's just, I think I actually have that as Matthew Shields on LinkedIn. So awesome. Well, I'll put those links in the show notes, Matt. Thanks again. No problem. Thank you. If you found value in today's podcast, please consider sharing this with someone that you believe could also benefit from this episode. You never know, you may be the catalyst that opens them up to a new way of operating their business and experiencing life. As always, it's an honor to be a small part of your journey. This is Raul Hernandez. Do good work.